As the flat of his blade blocked another bone-shattering blow from the orc's hammer, the Kellid's entire body rattled from the impact. I can't keep this up much longer. The hulking green warrior had slowly but surely forced him back along the side of the crashed skyboat. He could feel the heat from the strange purple flame getting closer and closer. The orc was cut in a dozen places, but he hadn't been able to make any of them deep enough to do any lasting damage. His opponent hadn't been able to get a clean hit on him at all yet, but with his size and power, he'd only need one. The orc raised his hammer, presenting an easy target, but the Kellid was still dazed from the last hit. He swung out, but it was slow, clumsy. The orc dodged back, and he only managed to slash open his tunic. He saw a hint of something against his chest. Dirty white, maybe some kind of bone armor? And then the orc swung down at him again. The Kellid raised his sword to block the blow, but at the last moment, the orc stopped and suddenly kicked out at his now unguarded stomach. Walked right into that one. The force of the kick launched him back into the suffocating heat. He hit the ground hard on his back, and his sword flew from his hand. The orc smiled and began walking towards him, banging his hammer against the hull of the boat as he came. He stood over the Kellid and said something in a deep, guttural tongue. The Kellid simply stared back. The orc frowned for a moment, then smiled and said in stiff, broken hallet, You strong little man, but I am stronger. Goodbye. The orc raised his hammer a final time, all his attention on the Kellid completely oblivious to the massive shadow rising up behind him. Just as the orc began the downward swing of the killing blow, an enormous spear, easily as thick around as the Kellid's own wrist, suddenly burst out from his chest. This is Pot Against the Machine. Pot Against the Machine. Welcome back to Pot Against the Machine, the only Pathfinder actual play podcast that'll appear from nowhere, yada yada yada, torso full of eggs, and everyone goes home happy. Or very, very upset. I'm your host, and here's everybody. I don't like that yoke at all. Hi. Hey. Hello. Hello, I'm very upset. Moderately upset. <laughs> sure once we get the recap, I'll be more upset. Do y'all think Zill eggs are better poached or fried? I think most things are better fried, right? Like, just in life? Question for the real egg eaters out here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would worry with the Zill egg specifically, because they're sort of an asexual reproduction. You don't know what's in there. It's like Danger Row. <laughs> also, poaching things is super hard. I'll bet Zach has just poached eggs in the forest somewhere. <laughs> I've, I do. Uh, I like my little sous vide, little hangy do. I got one off of Amazon. It's like fifty bucks. Of course, like, of course, it's, you did. Yo, it works. It works. Works. You're gonna you come feed something. Your food in the forest, as you not, do. Not in the forest. Just looking at the forest <laughs> from my house. Forest, forest adjacent. <laughs> forest adjacent. <laughs> just looking out at the woods, sous videing a. Mushroom, I would assume. <laughs> Portobello <laughs> eggs, baby. <laughs> yeah, I'm vegan except for Zill eggs. That's where I make my exception. I was going to say, I he's mean, some weird version of a Piscatarian that eats eggs, mm -hmm. but nothing else. Ovotarian, baby. Ovo that's, yeah. Zillow. Only specifically these <laughs> extra planar eggs. Chef. Oh, it's just gross, man. <laughs> Not, I like eggs, but I'm starting to like them less. Not Zill yeah. eggs. <laughs> so like an exo-ovo. Tarian, right? Nice. Is that yeah? There, yeah, that's, that's what we're going for. Yeah. Solid, solid wordplay. Gonna mm. keep cramming Latin together until we get it right, <laughs> <laughs> or we summon something. <laughs> nah, let's do this. Let's make a food podcast. We're like eighty percent yeah. of the way there. 
What happened last time, Sam, on the program? How was the program? Did anything happen on it? You know, before we find out what happened last time on the program, just a little bit of housekeeping here. For probably the first time in podcast history, I did make a couple of rules mistakes in the last few episodes, specifically with regard to attacks of opportunity. I know I was shocked to find this out too. Now though, no time has passed in the real world, though a bunch of time has passed in the game since Asher was paralyzed via attack of opportunity from a Zell that was already grappling him and thus couldn't make an attack of opportunity. And a non-trivial amount of time has passed in game since Alwyn was paralyzed and subsequently oviposited by an attack of opportunity Azale took in response to a melee touch attack, which is not a thing that provokes attacks of opportunity. Both of these events were, you know, rather impactful in our current situation, and a retcon would be pretty clumsy or disruptive to the story so far. So, instead, Jeff, Jero, Please accept as remuneration for the impossible paralysis these sky medals. Ooh, sky medal. Level eight. <laughs> what do they say, Sam? What do they say? Yeah, are they from anybody? Why would they say anything at all? That's so strange that you would ask. Well, we do happen to have a note attached to this first sky medal that says, um... Sorry about all the eggs. <laughs> know all ye by these presents, and to all dwarves, elves, giants, gnomes, goblins, halflings, humans, orcs, Yasoki, and all others of Galarian. Greetings. Know ye that Game Master of Pot Against the Machine has awarded the Sky Medal to Jeff for outstanding play in this episode, or in this case, reception of an outstanding play from the GM. Their actions have significantly contributed to the critical success of the very capable four, or the very loyal two, and Brixby and Alwyn. Their display of exceptional um, ability to be targeted by rules mistakes and unswerving devotion to the game reflect great credit upon them, and are in keeping with the highest traditions of the very capable four. All honors be rendered accordingly. Disobey this order unto penalty of our royal displeasure. Huzzah! That is from the Order of the Sky Medal. <laughs> Thank you, Order. <laughs> and um, for Jero, this Sky Medal is awarded for intrinsically productive leadership in the interactive area of using words to reveal the elements and images of the fight against the machine. You have immersed not only the ears, but also the hearts and minds of your listeners. And that's from J-Rod. Hey, nice. Thank you, J-Rod. So thank you to the Order of the Sky Medal and to J-Rod for those delightful Sky Medal messages. Now, for any of our patrons at the $10 and up level on Patreon or Kofi or however you say it, you do have the ability to submit an unlimited number of Sky Medals to be read on the show. Usually probably less awkwardly than that, but probably still awkward. For $10 a month, you can make Sam say anything you want. Oh, God. <laughs> Don't put it that way. <laughs> hey, I'm just reading between the lines here. He is legally required to read whatever you submit. Now, it may get bleeped out. Yeah, there might be bleeps. There will certainly be bludge. Mm -hmm. There'll definitely be zills, and there might be bleeps. Now, previously on the program, what even happened? It's been years since we last recorded. Ah, uh, the party went into, I believe, the stronghold of Shadrax. And, you know, I think there was some quick uh, reconnaissance on the outside, nothing too interesting there. Then they went in and immediately fought some Zill archers, and that actually went pretty well. Killed two of them outright, and then the third one ran away. And then when the party pursued the uh, Zill that ran away, Brixby was accosted by an invisible Zill and very nearly killed. Now the party did deal with the invisible Zill, and um, the fight ended in victory, of course, for the very loyal two and Brooks being Alwyn. But everybody is pretty hurt and pretty out of resources, and the kerfuffle has attracted the attention of two priest-like Zill who have come down from the north along with the injured Zill who ran away uh, just a few short moments ago. Now, the party attempted to 
negotiate a little bit with these people, saying they would um, leave for the night, rest, and come back with the appropriate spells to break the curse on Shadrax. But uh, the Zills wanted... What's it called? Collateral. Yeah, the Zills wanted collateral. They wanted people to stay behind while the religious spellcasters left. When we left things, uh, Brickby had said, no dice. That's where we are now. And that's how we're going to play today. No, yeah, no dice, dice at all. <laughs> it was a command. So yeah, um, to remind anybody who may have taken a couple weeks, Brixby just finished emphatically um, reminding these Zills that uh, nobody's going to be left down here. He felt very strongly about that. Well, okay. I uh, guess <laughs> we are ending the podcast? Just turn on the battle music and... <laughs> <laughs> Quietly fading into the dark, yeah. Since we're not rolling dice, can we just have like an epic montage to be the finale of the show? <laughs> yeah, of us do. getting murdered by Jill. <laughs> Set to girls just want to have fun. Mm, <laughs> copyright. Zills just want to have fun. That's better. Yeah. So, I mean, Brixby said something. It's maybe still echoing through the imagination space. So, yeah, I feel like uh, Alwyn is just going to kind of turn and look at him confusedly. And <laughs> that's all he's going to do. Like, Asher will look at, Za- at Zach <laughs> through the Whoa. fourth wall. Oh, oh, punching no. through that fourth wall. <laughs> it's like you've got to convince your rat folk this is a bad idea. No, uh, Asher will look to Brixby because. Both of us know Brixby's name and say, We are outgunned, outmanned, outnumbered, outplanned. And I don't think it makes sense to attempt an all out stand. By which I mean to say, I volunteer to stay behind. If that allows the rest of you to recuperate and escape. And, of course, return here to fulfill this bargain, then I volunteer. Do our Zill hosts have anything to say to that? As they close in, uh, the two priests have kind of crept in a little bit closer over uh, time during this conversation. Now, one of them says, Just one of you, you say? I suppose the All Mother might be amenable to such a thing, though... Of course, you are greatly inconveniencing us. You've already killed so many of our spawn. We should greatly prefer that two of you should permit. I'll stay, too, if you need two people. I don't know if they need two people. It simply sounds as though they'd prefer two people, and Kira, I do greatly appreciate your courage, but surely the All Mother would be willing to accept this in this circumstance and Asher I don't care what the all mother want <laughs> and frankly I don't care what these people want I'm not leaving you here by yourself it's stupid I did want to edge in here and say uh, listen I'm practical no one stays here alone turns back around these two they'll stay we'll go commune with his good Get you out of your rock prison bright and early tomorrow, yeah? And the two Zell exchange a look. They kind of are ignoring the, the longbow one in the back there. Yes. Very well. You may go and return in the morning. And we all expect to be very happy tomorrow. Brixby's just holding uh, Kira's gaze because it was really Kira that convinced them. It, it makes sense. He has a visceral response uh, and aversion to leaving anybody here. But there's just like an assurance. Um, he knows that Kira would never let anything happen to Asher without exhausting every option. And vice versa. I think seeing this then, um, Kira sort of gives Bricks like just the tiniest smile. 
Hey, I know that um, you have that whole thing about leaving people behind, especially underground, because, I don't know, because we talked about it after. Look, the point is, I'm, this won't be like last time, because um, cause you're coming back. You said. You basically promised, and I know that you wouldn't lie to us. So, go and get whatever you need and all your magic stuff and and come back and then we're going to totally be nice to these guys. Other condition. Brixby turns back around. We don't want either of them to be any trouble for you. So, I'm going to have them disarm themselves into this bag right now. And he goes and grabs the bag of holding. Turns back around. I expect you'll verify, but we just want to save you a lot of time. Then looks up at Asher and Kira and says, All in then. And Kira uh, holds up a, a fake plank of wood and just scrapes off chihuahuas into the bag. <laughs> <laughs> well, I assume that's how that spell works. <laughs> and the Zills are uh, just closing in to watch this process. Obviously, Kira's the one with the most visible weapons with the chainsaw, the greatsword, and the composite longbow. Asher's got more than a couple himself. On his person, he has a pistol in each holster, and he will deposit them. They're both mundane uh, into the bag of holding. And Asher unloads guns like clowns getting out of a very small car. <laughs> gun, a gun, a gun. Oh my god, it's true. Yeah, it's like one of those like over the top like movie tropes where the person <laughs> just keeps weapons, pulling them out. Much. Yeah. If anybody here has seen Last Action Hero, when the guy with the battle axe has his son hostage and he says, "Drop your weapons," and like the next ten minutes of the film is him dropping knives and guns. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, so Brix collects their weapons, looks over at the Zills and says, Yeah, nice and safe for you now. Uh, they do finish closing in and um, say, And uh, you won't mind if we just do a cursory search for safety purposes. By all means. Brix will step away with the bag. Well, the search of Asher, I will say... Well, are you unloading all your guns? Yeah, you gotta roll that sleight of hand, baby. If you are trying to keep one. <laughs> yeah, I was about to just announce my rolls, but I guess if you're trying to keep them, you should roll a sleight of hand. No, uh, he'll say, oh, you know what? I suppose my backpack. Pardon me. And he'll unzip his masterwork Jansport, and uh, he'll pull out uh, two misfired guns, one of which is his plus one, and then four additional functional guns and drop all of those <laughs> one at a time into the bag. It's a bit of a stressful situation, pardon my momentary forgetfulness. Uh, Asher, could you um put a mark on which one of these guns is the good one? The, like, the one with the, the big bang on it. I know it's broken right now, but um, <laughs> they all look the same. What do you... They all look rather different, distinctive... <laughs> In their own ways. <laughs> this one is gun metal gray. This one is gray. Look at the hex codes of each of them. Their color differs slightly. Now, um, the one that detects his magic, my good companion, is the one that in fact is imbued with said magic. Sounds good. Yeah. And Asher will pause for a moment and say, I don't expect anything will go awry, certainly, but just in case... And he'll take off his hat, and he'll put it in the bag of holding. Screams and explosions in the background. Finally. Brixby just <laughs> makes off. This is the long con. He's gone. <laughs> He's gone with the bag of holding. Yeah, yeah. He's he off. pulls out a Polaroid, takes a picture of Astra at the hat, and just mm-hmm. dashes out. <laughs> Gives it to the newspaper guy. Heading off to sell that to Fantasy TMZ. <laughs> And then he's off to the world wound, to Wrath of the Righteous, Rat of the Righteous. <laughs> but the bag of holding is so heavy, he only makes it 15 feet. <laughs> it's just slowly dragging the giant bag behind him. Hey, that's what the disc is for. All right. But, hate long goodbyes. This is an important one. Rixby is going to move away from the Zills now, who have interposed themselves between him and his friends. Say, first, approaching Kira. 
then Asher, then kind of standing in between them. We will be back. We will. And we'll be together again. Tomorrow. I know. Don't forget to check on Vargas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, yeah, this no. whole thing was just a bet that Vargas was going to come and fix everything. Yeah, we're just going to go to the Kellogg store and find a Kellogg that looks a little bit like him. <laughs> and just be like, look, he's totally fine. He's like the stunt double <laughs> for Vargas in all the scenes because he's too old to do his yeah. own stunts. <laughs> yeah. He is decrepit. It's just a guy with like a bad fitting bald cap on. <laughs> <laughs> It's also like a foot. It's it's just like Henry Cavill, so he's like a foot taller than Garth and Farkas. Uh, but um, Rigsby looks beyond his friends after saying goodbye and looks at the Zills and says, "And if you ever want to see the sweet sky over this earth again, you want to harm a hair on our friends' heads. You wouldn't want to come this long, only to forfeit your chances, yeah." Your friends will be perfectly safe, so long as you are swift. Doddle him. There will be no guarantees. Alowin, who still has his hood down and is just doing his best to look really weird and creepy, just takes out his uh, book. He's got this weird pale leather book with this spiral on it that doesn't look like a phrasma spiral. It's some different kind of spiral. And he just holds it up and says, Don't worry. I already promised you. I will let Ur, Will, remove your curse. I'll speak to him tonight and be back in the morning with his answer. But as my small furry friend there said, if you harm them, I know what the answer will be. Basari, I think, just takes uh, one step away from the Zills and she looks at Lucy that she's still holding and she looks at Kira and then she sort of more pointedly looks at Lucy and looks at the Zill and just says, we'll be back, my friends. We will not abandon. Hey, um, before you go, there's a gravity clip on that second, no, on one of the weapons in there. Just go ahead and switch that around. It's fun. Not that you'll need it, but you know, if you see a rabbit you need to hunt, with a hammer, you can have that I, I for don't now. Know what a gravity clip is, but sure, I'll, I'll give it a shot. It, it's on. Yeah, the, they'll show you. Yeah, 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 yeah. come on, come on, Basari. That's <laughs> um, it's a hair thing. You put it in your hair to, to clip it back. <laughs> I'm doing a bad job of flying right now, but I'm on a disc, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. We have officially split the party. Mm hmm. Wow. Split. Uh, it feels right. I mean, the situation feels wrong. But always split the party, friends. I love a party split. Let's see, which side of the coin should we watch first? Well, I can tell you, Kira's got a rousing game of sorry set up <laughs> for the downstairs team. Um, you're playing with the Zill? Um, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> they do cheat. They got extra arms. Mostly, mostly playing <laughs> with Asher. Yeah, but uh, is is willing to to allow them to watch. And only the most sarcastic every time she sends them back home. Like, Sorry, in the most obnoxious way you can be, like when you're seven and you play. You know, mm. <laughs> knock their piece off the board a little bit. Yeah, mm -hmm. like, those are just the rules. So if you want to check in on that riveting game, let me know. All right. Um, why don't we head up with the um, <laughs> dynamic duo of Alwyn and Brixby as you head on out of the stronghold. Oh, I guess it's a trio. A trio. Wasari is yeah. there. <laughs> uh, what's the plan? Are you just heading straight out? I mean, picking up the grenade launcher, heading to the steps. Brixby turns to Bashari, Basari and uh, casts fly on her. It says, you can uh, carry, yeah. Just pick up Alowin and fly him up because she's strong. <laughs> and Brixby will do the disc thing to get on out. 
Yeah. I mean, I guess maybe just individually checking in as we're leaving, unless you want us to roll anything. Uh, Brix is pretty quiet and, and focused. Yeah, I mean, you're going to be totally unimpeded on the way out, so if we want to just give us sort of a glimpse inside of what's going on. Alo and I feel like we'll tell the other two, even though it should be obvious. By the way, I was not telling the truth at all. I don't doubt whatsoever that Twilet Myrrh could break their curse, but I'm not going to ask them to. They were not very nice people. So I'm assuming we'll just go get help and come back and kill them all. Brixby puts his paw on Alowin's chest and is like, Wait, what? You gods not gonna intervene? Oh, lords. No, we're good. We're out of here. <laughs> no, uh, Brixby at the same time, um, it's like, no, I, I know they're gonna get the uh, same deliverance and freedom afforded to their predecessors. We have a, uh, a way of sending them where they need to go. Let's get back to town. We'll talk to Red Tooth. We need to sort some things out before we head back here in the morning. By this time, it's like evening. I mean, by the time you, you know. Find your way up to the waterfall, climb past the the radioactive water, and then go through that um, mile-long pitch-black cave back to the mines. By the time you get all the way out of that, it's getting dark, and, you know, you you did a seven-hour ride this morning, and then you did all this adventuring. Are you planning on doing, like, a forced march back to the camp? Or back to Idenvey? Or... If force marching is the only way to get back, then force marching is the way we'll go. Did they give us twenty four hours? Are they expecting y'all to be us y'all to be back to get us at eight in the morning? I, I did say morning, but I'm I'm pretty sure they're yeah. not just gonna get up and be like, Okay, they're not here <laughs> to see the sunrise that we can't see in the earth where time is completely an illusion. Time to coup de grasse, everybody. Yeah. yeah, I mean I'm sure they don't necessarily know how far away Iden Bay is. Um but I'm sure Asher and Kira can explain it to <laughs> him. The basic logistics of how long it will take to get out and get back in. They might not even know how long it takes to get to the surface from here. Yeah, these ones may have never even gone to the tunnels. <laughs> it's going to be like two, <laughs> three months. Men. <laughs> yeah, so by the time you guys get back to town, uh, which will be very, very late at night indeed, you'll be fatigued and you will have taken non-lethal damage it's 1d6 of points of non-lethal damage per hour and rather than belabor it uh we'll just say basically three points an hour so you got 18 points of non-lethal damage on each of you and the horses are in very very rough shape pushing themselves so hard but before we cut to Idenvey at 2 a.m or so let's Head back under the mountain to check in with Kira and Asher in the Zill Priests. What are the Zill Priests doing? Well, I think the Zill Priests will go, oh, We have a room prepared for all of you, some of our finest guest quarters. If you just follow us uh, this way, we can set you right up. You'll be very comfortable here until morning, I can assure you. Well, that's... Unexpectedly kind, I thank you for this. Asher will follow, relieved, but hapless. Uh, can I can I just do a quick sense motive? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Particularly good at this, and I'm shocked that Asher is like, yeah, this works. <laughs> no, I'm just enjoying my last few moments of playing him. Ooh, that's a three on the die for, what, a four, I think? Five sense motive? Oh, no, a six, a six sense motive. Seems legit, they've got a room for you. Kira's like, oh, right, yeah, sleepover. Uh, and we'll also follow. This is great. Love a sleepover. And, yeah, they lead you over to the, the left-hand side of the room where there's a sort of a barred door in blocking off this hallway, and they'll open that up for you to let you go into a nice room. Is that a real token? Yeah. To the north of yeah, Asher? Yeah, there's a, a human man in the room already looks to be kind of dozing. He's a middle age. If you head in there, they'll close the gate behind you. 
Well, good news, Kira. Uh, looks like you, there is someone you can steal a bed from if you're feeling in the mood. Well, I was going to ask if you wanted to play sorry, but um, yeah, I can start with stealing the bed. Maybe once he's awake. No, I, I don't want you to. <laughs> I was trying to make light of the situation. Oh, okay. Well, you could have led with that. Sometimes you're very literal. Most times. But I'm proud of you for trying to make light of the situation. Thank you. She will walk over and drag that man out of bed. No, before she does. <laughs> Asher does as a cash detect evil at the dozing human. Ah, uh, he does not detect his evil. Oh, thank Keldira. At worst, he's a chaotic neutral like Brixby. Ouch, Brixby's the worst case scenario. Woof. <laughs> well, we know he's not evil. Brixby can't even hear that. Somewhere a single tear falls from Brixby's eye as he rides. <laughs> Without knowing. <laughs> he doesn't know why. <laughs> I feel I've been besmirched. <laughs> um, so Kira does not actually drag this man out of bed, but I do think is like just sort of watching Asher. Partly to pick up on the vibes and partly sort of like a... I think she senses there's tension here and technically understands it as in like, you know, that's the, just the two of them in this giant enemy place. They're unarmed. Uh, but she's very rigidly sticking to this, like, no, we're together, fine, our friends are coming back, what could possibly happen, sort of here. And so staring, just like watching him after a little while. Asher, are you okay? You, you gave away your hat, and also you almost got dragged into a wall, and also a train track, and it's been weird. Asher will just kind of sit down on the ground, the old knees up, and leaning his back against the wall. And he'll rest his hands on his knees and he'll look at them. And Kira, yeah, there's blood on these hands. I've performed surgery on two people in the last day. I've had more than my share of near-death experiences between me personally and those around us. We didn't have the strength to perform this mission on our own. And we experienced the tepid hospitality at best of Aidenve, so well normally, yes, I'm of the optimistic sort, I I don't know how good our chances are of making it out of this underground fortress alive. I'd like to think Basari can prove a, a valuable ally in convincing the town. I'd like to think, perhaps, if not for us, for their own safety, the people of Idenve might rally to our aid. But I also have to make peace with the possibility, not giving up, not resigning to the fact, but the possibility that today might be our last full day. I don't know. I've seen what the Azil can do, you have, to all sorts of people. And apparently even to spiders, which is pretty weird. But I wouldn't say I'm okay. I'm honestly tired. Sad. Sad because I feel like we failed. And even if we do make it out of here live, which, to be fair, is the best possible outcome, I'd really prefer to keep on living. It's been at great cost. And I don't want others to perish in our rescue. So, not in the most cheerful mindset, I suppose, but maybe a good night's sleep will turn that around. Kira sits also just like, I guess, opposite wall, Asher, um, watching as he speaks and just sort of like trying to internalize the words he's saying. It's certainly the most frank she's heard him been but also the most like this could be bad and I think that might be sort of the first time someone has said it and she sort of internalized it um, I think this is maybe not this is not the first time all day certainly I think there was that moment when both like Bricks B and Asher were sort of in danger before and she was like oh this could be bad but hearing Asher say it is sort of like a oh yeah okay um, and so she's quiet for a minute and says when we first went under the hill back in Torch to fight, well, 
to fight the bugs first, and then also that frog thing, and then a bunch of other stuff. There were a lot of times I thought that I thought I'd have to leave by myself. Just, you know, I, I let I let I let my friend go down there alone, and she didn't come back. And I just kept thinking maybe if I hang out and and get real strong and pick up all of these new weapons, I can keep my new friend safe. And it worked for a while. We went underground at Torch, and again in Scrapwall. And for the most part, when we stayed together, things were okay. There were some touch-and-go moments, and I guess those were scary, but I just kind of thought we would bounce back. And then... And then Vargas left. The first time, I mean, when he... When he tried to help us, and... And it went kind of as bad as that could go. And... I thought, okay, we see what happens when we split up. It won't happen again. But here before, when they gave us the option and you said you wanted to stay, I know I wasn't nice, but I, I, I didn't mean, I just can't keep leaving people behind. Honestly, I didn't even really want Brix to go. I just kind of have to trust he'll be okay with Aloe and Basari because she has my weapon. I'm not making, I know that I am not good at words all the time and that I say too many or not enough or to give stickers at the wrong time. I just mean, if this is where things end, I promise it won't be without a fight from both of us. And then if everything works out after, we can maybe have a discussion over who should have that tallest sticker you can have like an extra benefit point because of how we're friends and stuff and I guess technically because you are taller I just I mean it's worked out before and it keeps working as long as we're kind of all together so maybe this and sleeping not in someone else's bed maybe this is how we win we can just wait for our friends to come back and then kill those spiders, but not for real. That's secret part of the plan. In case anyone's listening, this is a joke. Haha. <laughs> <laughs> I think while this talking's gone on, the, the man in the corner has kind of woke up and he's been sitting quietly, like not trying to eavesdrop, but he is in a rather small room with, with the two of you. Um, We're having a private conversation, sir. Kira doesn't say that. Izzy does. And he, he sits up and he said, I uh, apologize for listening in. I obviously don't have context for most of that, but uh, I'm very sorry that you were dragged into this as, as well. It's a terrible place. Where did you get dragged from? Also, hi, I'm Kira. This is Asher. We're, we're going to not die. You're welcome to come if you want. On the not not dying. I would definitely prefer not to die. Uh, my name is Father Sardis, a cleric of Avatar. I was the uh, resident healer and representative of the Church of Avatar at Perdyton. And obviously, this has gone about as badly as it possibly could. Not dying would be great. You said cleric of, and I was like, yes! There's an abbot, and I'm like, well, great, we don't have any money on us, so I guess we're gonna <laughs> die after all. It does make sense that, like, the cleric for a mining corporation would be the cleric of Abadar, though. <laughs> does it? Just so much context I'm missing out on. Yeah, he's basically, like, the god of, like... Civilization, commerce, bridges, and roads. Kira waves at the, at the person, like, hey, um... Good news, I didn't take your bed. We are trying to get out of here. Uh, how long have you how long have you been here? Do you have helpful information for us? Not that it matters. We're just waiting for our friends casually. But if you did have secret helpful information, you could whisper it. Or write it on a piece of paper. Don't know that I have any uh, secret information. I am been here for about a day. They tried to get me to remove their curse, but I, I don't have that kind of ability. Um, yeah. 
thoughts about it. It's not a wonderful place. I don't know that they have any actual food here, if you were concerned about that. I don't think that they eat. They just, you know, do the whole baby's ill thing. When our friends get back, you can have 120 goo tubes. No, let's not be hasty, but... I know it's a rather personal question, but... Are you expecting... Are there any buns in your oven that the Zills overposit you? Now that of me, they left alone under hopes that I could help them, but I'm not sure how long that will last. Asher was about to hand him a paperback copy of what to expect when you're expecting Zill babies. Uh, but just <laughs> I'll roll a slight of hand if I need to. No, um, well, that is certainly good news that you didn't suffer that unfortunate infestation. I understand that breaking a curse is a rather powerful bit of divine magic. Do you have access to remove a disease? If if you were, once you are, because our friends are coming, uh, once you are freed of these bars, are you able to utilize that divine magic to help any of your companions that may have been infected? Uh afraid uh, that is probably beyond the magic that Abadar promised to me, but I am, in addition to being a practitioner of the uh, divine arts, I they have uh, more mundane healing skills as well. I, I can probably do, you know, the in-game equivalent of a medicine check pop out some Zillix. <laughs> ah, yes, a heal check. Have you tried that? I mean, I guess there's no one in your immediate vicinity to to do that with, but if we could get to your friends? Yeah, if either of you have any eggs in you, I could, you know, we could give it a shot right now. I think we're pretty clean. Thanks, though. I just mean, in the future, should the opportunity arise... Maybe it's a good skill to have. What did you tell them? Uh, you said they were keeping you here so you could help. Are they still waiting for you to help? I think they're relatively convinced that I can't, but they just haven't gotten round to getting rid of me yet. Do you have any indication of their number? Have they gathered together for any sort of movie night or dance off anything at all that might give you an indication of how many to expect at any time uh, I don't think there are very many down here but uh, I believe they impregnate the the workers and then that they can spawn very very quickly so at any time there could be more of them dragged everyone down here, so assume you know. Have you had the opportunity to observe the one they call the All Mother Shandrax? Yes, she's been by. She's a much like the others, larger and more menacing. I assume she's the most powerful of the lot, but don't really have anything to go on other than, you know, the extra menacing spikes. Sure, I know sometimes our companions are rather skilled at ascertaining information simply through observing. If there's anything that you happen to catch with your plainer knowledge, we would be most appreciative. For example, if you were to assess her, like, physical health and break that down into numeric terms... How, like, what What would you set that number at, do you think? Probably, like, wicked high. I didn't roll great on my knowledge planes, but, um, probably wicked, wicked high. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then anything else, like, like, if maybe she was super good at attacking or defending or 
really hard to be attacked? Like, would you say any of those things you picked up? And again, really focusing on quantifying this, if at all possible, with literal actual numbers. She had guns, um, so I assume that's the main thing she would use, but they all, you know, they have claws and can bite and everything. I assume she would start with the guns. Kira looks at Asher when he says guns. He doesn't say anything, just kind of the expression of, oh, you have those! But not so. And a half smile kind of forms on Asher's face. Well. And Asher feels, for whatever reason, just knowing that somebody has seen this creature and lives to tell the tale, and that she's not eight stories tall with big red glowing eyes. That it's like, <laughs> well, Father Sardis, we may well get to see your healing expertise tomorrow. I suggest we get some rest. We may need our full strength. And I think um, we can cut back to the other group, who is, um, at this point, it's very, very late at night, and you are approaching Idenvey, the gates of on the uh, wooden stockade wall are closed now they were you know open during the day but night's a different time as you know you're all absolutely exhausted from riding for 14 hours today in addition to you know struggling through a veritable army of zil yeah. and zil babies yeah with fatigue alowin is 11 pounds overweight <laughs> <laughs> Woof. Yeah, I would think, like, just in terms of the sheer level of exhaustion here, it got to be close to the most tired you've ever been. I mean, 18 points of non-lethal damage just from fatigue. Yeah. And the radiation poisoning and the Zill eggs. And <laughs> oh, yeah, you're both carrying <laughs> Zill eggs. That's fun. Yeah. I think he will actually say, though, uh to the other two as they're slowly dragging their way back to town on their horses. Like, he just kind of looks up at the sky and smiles and he says, This is very pleasant. I enjoy your company, but I'm not a fan of traveling when the stars aren't out. Isn't this so much better? Brixby, who decided against riding a horse, <clears throat> is doing the disc. Doesn't turn his face from the gate. And he says, No, no, Halloween. <laughs> Nothing is better than traveling alongside the complement of my family, my group. <sighs> I know you're new to this, us, but this isn't something we do often. We bleed together. We, we don't leave each other behind. It's... <sighs> let's just... Let's get to Red Tooth. Let's get to High Arm. Let's get this done. Just kind of look at you kind of just puzzled. Because I think, like, even though he's... At this point, he's been with the party, like, probably a week and a half as far as, like, all of the travel and everything to Iden Bay and that. But he's still just... He doesn't get it. He's just, like... He doesn't understand that kind of bond that the rest of the group has. Uh, no, it's true. I mean, like, I I think that that is absolutely how Alwyn and Brixby's conversation would go in this instance. I don't... Yeah, like, Brixby's got to be broken. Like, he's... Oh, uh, he's he's so messed up. Having to leave these friends behind. And Alan's just like, yeah, okay, we're out of there. We're going to go talk to some other people. And then head <laughs> like, he... Yeah. He's very... It's... I try to get across like how just off-putting it is like because it's less naivety and more that he's just doesn't seem to care like it's an absence of any sort of emotion other than just kind of like a general pleasantness hmm. and like I said like even in like like the aftermath of the combat and stuff he was just kind of like oh I have eggs in me that's something to deal with like it's just very off-putting. See, Brixby is in a similar spot to if you've ever gotten in trouble before, say maybe at work <laughs> or at school, you spend that entire time 
between now and the reckoning or that moment of transgression and the reckoning, imagining what you're going to say and then reworking it and reworking it again and again. That is what the entire seven hour ride is. It's just how can Brixby convince the already really difficult and insular town council um, who may uh, find this technically spy issue to be more important than than Zills that are, you know, mm. half a day's ride away. So he's just kind of working it over again and again, kind of yeah. distracted, not talking, very unlike him normally to not be making small talk. He is just like, Red Tooth, we have to know. And uh, I mean, I'm sure Basari is just kind of like, uh, <laughs> well... <laughs> yeah, I think Basari's like, I could just go. I could just leave right now and be done with it. But she's not doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you all saved her. If she takes my hammer, we're hunting her down. <laughs> she's the real BBG. But yeah, do we do we get in through the gates? Do they allow us in? Um, well, the gates don't just open when you approach. Oh. But I think as you get closer, a, a guard's voice will call out and, and say, State your business. Brixby, Alwyn, and Bashari, and Party Town to the north. We're on our way to High Home with important news for Red Fang. Open the gates so we don't have to slow these horses. They pause for a second and he goes up. Went there. A couple others of you. If we don't want to make an adjustment to anybody's party size this evening, perhaps we'd hold this line of questioning until we're able to speak with Red Fang. And he pauses another moment, and then you hear sort of a, a pulley engage, and he starts hauling the, the rope that pulls the big huge gate open, and it slowly uh, slides open to let you into Idenvey. Much obliged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, he's been wearing Asher's hat the whole way back. He took it out of the... <laughs> Slides down his face. <laughs> he just It's just rat shoulders with a hat, and he just tips the front of it regardless. <laughs> Got like an eye hole poked out so you can see. Oh, no. The hat is ruined. <laughs> Gives... Yeah, I don't know. There must have been something sharp in the back of holding. It's... Oh, he had to cut slits for his ears. It's a whole big thing. <laughs> Oh, Excellent cuts the uh, letter to Cassandra right in oh. half. Uh, you hate to see it. No, oh, no. <laughs> that wasn't like most of the reason why he put his hat in there for sure. Embroiders Brixby on the front, just like his favorite <laughs> Rat World style hat. <laughs> the deep cut. <laughs> deep cuts. <laughs> the deepest. Yeah. You best believe red, red mouth getting dragged out of bed. As soon as we show up to high home, um, he sleeps there, right? Um, is that where he sleep? I believe you were told that he he doesn't sleep there. Yeah. No, I think it was said he had a house. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because Kira wanted to sleep in his bed, but it was not in the building. Fair. <laughs> Good. Yes. <laughs> so you do know where the head of the town council is, but I don't think you actually know where. Red Fang lives, and you do know, um, you know, where you can sleep at High Home. You have free beds there. Ah, uh, well, even though Red Fang is a bit more amenable to our cause, we only really know where the Elderman lives. Let's go wake him up. Lead the way? Uh, in the mood to wake anyone up who'll get in the way, I suppose. Let's go get this octogenarian out of bed. They don't need sleep. Oh, he's almost up for the day already, you know. He's on that Vargas schedule. That's true. He's making lunch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's got to get up at three in the morning and complain that the newspaper is not there yet, like my grandfather <laughs> used to do. It's time to unzip the staggerony lips. It's true. Deep cut. <laughs> the streets are absolutely deserted right now, as one would expect from a good old Deadeye fearing town. But uh, you make your way to the Bell Quarter, uh, completely unimpeded, uh, except by your own exhaustion. 
And there's Ivik Gunnett's house. There are no candles burning in any of the windows. No old man sitting on the porch this time. Just a simple house. Let's uh, give a good hammer on that door there. It takes a bit, you know. He's, he's not a young man. He's not very spry, and he can't just switch on a light or anything, but eventually you'll see, like, a a candle light up uh, in one of the, the rooms in the house, and then slowly you can follow the glow from window to window as, as he uh, paces his way, you know, across the house, and slowly with his little, his shuffling steps and half asleep kind of manner. He's still hammering on the door the entire time. <laughs> He'll go up to the door, not actually open it, and say, What's all that racket? It's the middle of the night! Brixby, and Alwyn, and, well, a friend, doesn't matter. We come bearing news that doesn't wait for sleep. Um, he'll slowly open the door, um, and, you know, he's, he's got the pink face of uh, somebody who just woke up, and he's all bleary-eyed, and what little hair he has is all sticking up around his head, um, but he sort of holds out the candle to get a look at you, and he says, Dear Rastal, you, you three look like death warmed over. Come in, come in. What is it that's got you out at this time of night? Where are your friends? They're with the Zill. Everything that we had mentioned before. The potential troubles to the north. The, uh... <sighs> Listen, I need to ask you something frankly. Do you have any skills in healing? Do you... Or is that, uh... Uh, cricket legs. More his ambit. So I'm not a healer. I'm afraid cricket legs isn't really either, but we we have a, a very skilled cleric in town. Um, uh, Brother Gahar Dervich, he's the uh, head of our, our Church of Arastal. He's a very, very powerful healer. He, um, he'll be able to see to your, your wounds, certainly. I, I appreciate that. I, um, I'm sorry. I'm just puts his kind of little tiny rat thumb and forefinger in between his nose and eyes. It's been, it's been a long ride. Well, we found North Perdition, Purdy Town, as it were, was souls lost underground. In that cave, that mine, something evil far beyond what we've experienced. We, we left them, two of them, Kira, Asher, we had to, they had us. I, um, he, we, uh, he just puts his hand on his stomach. Halloween. Explain it. I'm just... I need to sit down. Then he does. And when we'll kind of watch Brixby go sit down, then he'll turn back to the Elderman and say, We found the Zill. They... Well, there were quite a few of them, and it turns out that they've taken all of the miners, and he looks over at Bashari and says, Almost all of the miners... And, well, they did something to them that's going to make more Zill, and we're worried they may have done it to Brixby and I as well, which is why we need the attention of a priest. And he just kind of stops for a second, and you realize that he's, like, almost nodding off, even though his, like, demeanor hasn't changed at all. Like, you can tell he's also massively tired. But he kind of shakes his head a little bit and then says, We also believe that we may need to have a discussion about our prisoner. Because, well, things in that mine are not good. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. Sorry. I, uh, 
I need to impress on you right now that this isn't our problem. This isn't the problem of Purdy Town. This isn't the problem of anybody near that blessed mine. This will be Iadenve's problem and Numeria's problem and Galarian's problem if we don't do anything about it. I don't mean to cut my friend off, but I need to provide context that what we're asking you are not some adventurers that bit off more than they can chew and call me back asking help tilting at a dragon. No, this is visceral end to everything that you have so diligently protected inside of these antler-lined walls. What we're about to ask you, we need. Everything we need. We came to you because, well, we would hope that this would minimize the discussion. Expediency is important. Now, sorry, Alwyn, continue. Yes, as Brixby said, this is a very, very dangerous issue. This Queen Zill is trying to get out, and it seems like some of her spawn actually can get out. So, well, you are the closest settlement, and honestly, I don't know if even everyone here could beat them. They're very powerful, but if we all pull everything together and maybe with the help of that strange man in the jail, we might be able to stop them before there's too many. Basari here can tell you how many other miners there are, and, well, you can see when you help us how many eggs they make, so that should help to impress upon you how dangerous this situation is. And it's, I'm trying to imagine this because, like I said, like he does not change tone or break expression or anything. So, like, the dichotomy between, like, him and Brixby explaining how dangerous this is is probably a little weird, but he's doing the best he can to impress upon the Elderman how dangerous of a situation this actually is in his way. I think Basari will chime in and, and say everything they've said is true. The Zill, uh, they descended up, up on Purdyton and there was one of them could walk through the stone itself and drag us into it as well and it, it picked us off one by one. Those who were already in the caves were set upon by the more conventional Zill and they took literally everyone. They dragged us under the ground. They left me embedded in a wall. These these two and the rest of their friends rescued me and they managed to defeat some of the monsters, but they will spread. They will consume bodies endlessly once they're free and I believe it's only a matter of time they will stop at nothing either one of you want to roll me a diplomacy check and then Basari can aid before we do that I gotta add something in there <clears throat> well uh, there's also uh, in addition to potential provisional work release of someone that absolutely understands this enemy and uh maybe uh, acutely designed to help us combat it, I would point out two things. One, this individual, you and I would say, is indisputably lawful. They uh, willingly uh, surrendered themselves to the justice system. Then they could potentially have blasted their way out. And I don't mean that as a form of disrespect. Second, we're going to need something beyond that. He slides a piece of parchment towards the <laughs> towards the man. It says, "If you have the power to get any of this uh, magic, some of it's divine, some of it's arcane, in scroll form for us before we leave tomorrow, we'll pay, of course, but we don't know who to ask. So if we can get any of this, these here." He points to the removed disease X5. We need these to make sure that nobody has points the, the like boba 
bubble that's inside his stomach and moves it around a little bit. This one, uh, well, there's something down there that makes us sick. And then these, well, this is just wishful thinking. So he points through a couple arcane ones near the end. If you've got these, we could probably do something with them. But we really just need, and points again at the removed disease scrolls, at the very least. Now, um, we need healing. We need to rest, and we need to head back there, all within probably the next 12 to 16 hours. I know we're asking a lot of you in a town that's not used to accommodating outsiders, but if there's one thing we can agree on, whether it's the Bowfather or what it is that guides this one or me, is that whatever is in that mine is the opposite of the world we'd like to see. So anyone want to roll a diplomacy check to see? It's certainly not me. <laughs> um, but sorry, AIDS. I'll aid. I'll try to aid. You know, Alan's got good... So, Basari AIDS, that's a plus two. Uh, <laughs> Brixby AIDS with an 18. Brixby AIDS, okay. So that is a plus four. I got a nine on the die. So that is, let's see, 18, 22, 22, 25. It's a pretty good roll. So I think while you've been talking, like the ivex has been holding up this single candle and he's got like his other hand on his chest and mouth kind of hanging open. And he'll say, my... My word, my... Um, yes, um... I would say all of you could s sleep here, but you, you might be more comfortable in the high home. There's certainly more beds, but I can, um... I can go out and, and rouse a Red Fang, and he's been... He's been pleading your case, and, and um, we can... Ah, uh, we'll, we'll do what we can, um... Go, go get some rest, and, and we'll talk first thing in the morning. And we'll we'll figure this out, and we will see what we can do. Thank you. I. I well. Numeria thanks you too for your understanding. Just discs out the door. And we'll kind of nod to him and also say, "Thank you very much for your time. I need to go sleep." And he will all follow Brixby out. Yeah, Basari comes behind you and says, Nobody said there'd be more walking. I thought we were done with the walking. <laughs> and as the three remaining party members go to sleep in Idenvey, and the two party members deep beneath the earth, along with their buddy, Father Sardis, uh, dream away of a world beyond Zills. I think I'm going to bed. Good night, Sam. Night, Sam. Good night, Sam. You get a good night when my party's back together, Sam. <laughs> Have a bad night, Sam. <laughs> Quality of night pending. <laughs> <laughs> Pot Against the Machine is property of its creators, all rights reserved. Pathfinder and the Iron Gods Adventure Path are properties of Paizo Publishing. Please visit them at paizo.com for more information. Theme Against the Machine, written and performed by our own Zach. Please consult the show notes for additional music and sound effect licensing information. Go, 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 go.